Okay, everyone, uh, unit eight, my favorite one, acids and bases. If I ever say something is my favorite that should send shivers down your spine. Anyway, uh, let's get into this. So, acids and bases. I'm sure we've all heard that word before, at least I hope all of you have heard the word acids before. But let's get into exactly what those are, okay? So acids and bases. We touched a little bit on this before when we covered types of chemical reactions. We covered, you know, acid-base reactions. A Bronsted acid and Bronsted base operate on this principle. They are proton donors, in the case of an acid, or they are proton stealers, in the case of a base. When we say proton, we mean the H plus ion. These are all terms that apply in aqueous solution, okay? So a proton donor is a species that when it dissociates, it dissociates into an H plus and something else. Okay, proton donor, it has a proton that it releases when it dissociates and that proton can be donated to another species in the solution. With a proton stealer, that's called a base. Now, bases are very commonly in the form of uh, some base OH, okay? Meaning that when they dissociate in solution, they will become base plus plus OH minus, okay? Whereas an acid would be in the form AH, and when it dissociates in solution, it would become A minus and an H plus, okay? So this is the general structure of an acid, but that's pretty self-intuitive. Something dissociates to form an H plus. This requires a little bit more explanation, okay? Why do these ions steal protons? Well, one of the products of a base dissociation is the ion OH minus. And if you memorized your ions at the beginning of the year, you would know that's called the hydroxide ion. Anyway, the hydroxide ion is what we use to index bases, okay? Because the hydroxide ion, once it reunites with an H+, plus, OH minus plus H plus produces water, H2O, okay? The OH minus is a very, very powerful thief of H plus. So from there, we're going to introduce another thing that I think many of you have at least heard of somewhere before, even if you don't know exactly what it is, this thing called pH. pH is a measure of how acidic or basic a solution is. A solution is more acidic if it has more acid, or more specifically, a solution is more acidic if it has more H plus ions. A solution is more basic if it has more base in it, or more specifically, a solution is more basic if it has more OH minus ions. The formula for pH is the negative log of the concentration of H plus, okay? Or it can be rewritten as the negative log of the concentration of H3O plus. Now let me explain to you what I just did there. So in real apl uh, applied chemistry, the proton by itself, the H plus ion by itself doesn't exist, okay? When I have an acid, and some species with an ionic bond to a hydrogen, and when that dissociates into A minus and H plus, the H plus instantaneously goes out and it finds a water molecule, okay? It goes out and finds a water mo molecule and the H plus bonds to that water molecule to form H3O plus, okay? The H plus ion is very, very unstable by itself and it never likes to exist by itself. So, the AP readers, even though they will accept H+, if you really want to demonstrate that you know your stuff, you would use the concentration of H3O+, okay? 
because if you were to do an experiment where you dissolved uh, acid in solution, if you tried to measure the concentration of H+, plus, so if you did a laboratory experiment and you measured the concentration of the H plus ion, you would get zero, okay? Because the H plus ion does not exist in solution. You would measure uh, the concentration of H plus by its concentration as H3O plus, okay? Because all of the H plus ions, once they're formed, they react with water to form H3O plus. So the amount or the concentration of H3O plus that you have is equivalent to the amount of H plus that you would have had if H plus can exist on its own. Okay, anyway, so from this point forward, we're going to be writing it like this in the form H3O plus. So the pH is the negative log of the concentration of H3O plus. Now, very commonly, they're not just going to outright give you the concentration of H3O+. You're going to be given uh, grams of acid because acids and bases, when they're out of solution, they exist as solids, okay? They exist as solids, and once you put an acid in solution, then it dissociates, and then it becomes aqueous with the liquid. But out of solution, it's a solid, so you can measure how many grams of that solid you have. And they're going to say, okay, I have this many grams of acid. I put the acid in water. It completely dissociates. So all of the um, grams of acid I have before, all of those become ionized. Okay. So what you would do there is you would take your initial grams of acid. You would calculate the molar mass of your acid. And then you would figure out how many moles of solid acid you have. And then once you drop that solid into the container and it all dissociates, however many moles of AH you have would be equivalent to however many moles of A minus and however many moles of H plus. 2.5 moles of AH, I'd have 2.5 moles of A minus and 2.5 moles of H plus, which we now know is just 2.5 moles of H3O plus. So now that I have moles, um, they're going to tell me, okay, it's in 1.2 liters of solution. 2.5 moles divided by 1.2 liters of solution, that's like 2.05 molar. The molarity is 2.05. Okay, so now that I have a concentration of H3O+, plus, that's 2.05 molar, I take the negative log of that, and that's how I get my pH. Okay, now... In the same process, there also exists something called pOH. pOH. pOH equals the negative log of the concentration of OH minus. All right, there's one pattern I want you to see here. Whenever, any time in chemistry, you see a P attached to something like this, the P designates negative log, okay? We're going to see something later called pKa. That's just the negative log of the Ka. Okay? Every time you see P, that's uh, P represents that you're taking the negative log of whatever this is. We're also going to have something called pKb. Now say it with me. pKb equals the negative log of Kb. All right, but we're going to get into that later. Let's stick with this now. Concentration of OH minus. In much the same way, you're going to be given uh, some base in the form of some base OH, and you're going to be told that you have this many grams of that. You're going to convert to moles. That moles is going to be the amount of moles of OH minus you have in the dissociated solution. And once you have moles of OH minus, they're going to give you the volume of the solution, it's 1 liter, it's 2 liters, it's 12 liters, and then you're going to calculate molarity, you're going to calculate concentration. Moles of solute divided by liters of solution. And that's how you get your concentration OH minus. That's how you get pOH, okay? Now, pH plus pOH 
always equals 14. Okay. So if I have one, I can calculate the other. If I have pOH, I can calculate pH. So um, if we go on this pH scale, pH scale ranges from like 0 to 14, around about. And since the total pH and pOH always sum to 14, we can say that a neutral solution, a neutral solution is such that the pH equals 7. Okay? When the pH is 7, that also means that the pOH is 7. So that's a neutral solution, when pH equals pOH. All right? What type of solution is that? That is pure water, pure H2O. Okay? Pure H2O has a pH of 7. Okay? And that introduces us to something called the KW. KW is the K equilibrium constant for the auto dissociation of water. All right? What do I mean when I say auto dissociation of water? I mean the water molecule, H2O, naturally dissociates. Okay? Picture water like this. It naturally dissociates to a very small extent into H plus and OH minus. It naturally dissociates. Or the equation would more properly be written as 2H2O becomes H3O plus plus OH minus. Okay? Auto dissociation of water. Water naturally dissociates into H3O plus and OH minus. That is the reason why we have a pH and a pOH. Because you can't have a pH or a pOH if you don't have a concentration of H plus or OH minus. So what if I want to go from pH to the concentration of H3O plus? What if I want to go backwards? Well, we know pH equals negative log concentration H3O plus. Okay, so how about this? How about I negate both sides? If I negate both sides, this becomes a plus, this disappears. Then to get rid of this log, I need to um, have 10 as a base and raise it to both sides as the exponent. So what do I mean by that? I have 10 as a base and this is the exponent to 10. I've got 10 as a base, this is the exponent to 10. Okay? So why is this important? I told you that in a neutral solution the pH is 7, the pOH is 7. That means in a neutral solution I have 10 to the negative 7 that equals my concentration of H3O+. Plus. So the concentration of H3O plus in water is 10 to the negative 7. Does everyone see how I just did that? I just took pH and I went backwards. Okay? 10 to the negative pH equals the concentration of H3O plus, and the same principle can be applied to pOH. So back to this Kw, this uh, equilibrium constant. So the Kw, like we all know, is the concentration of products over reactants. That's the formula for all uh, K expressions, equilibrium constant expressions. So let's see here, what are our products? Concentration H3O plus times concentration OH minus. Okay? And water, since water is our solvent, water is what the solution is made of, it is considered a liquid, and if it's considered a liquid, it's not participating in our K expression. Now that is different from if we were to have a normal acid uh, dissociation equation, where we would have some AH dissociating, or in this case being in equilibrium with A minus plus H plus, okay? This would also be aqueous this thing in our product side, okay? Because that's not the liquid, that's not the solvent, that is something that has been dissolved in the solution, okay? Now all of our reactions, uh, reactants and products are aqueous in this equation. So if I were to draw the K expression for this equation, it would be the Ka, 
A signifying that it's the K expression for an acid, it would be concentration of A minus times concentration of H plus over concentration of AH, okay? So, here we already discussed that the concentration of H3O plus and OH minus is 10 to the negative 7. So, 10 to the negative 7 times 10 to the negative 7, KW equals 10 to the negative 14. And by that same logic, if we take PKW, if we take the negative log of 10 to the negative 14, PKW equals 14. Do you see the connection? Your pH and your pOH must also always equal 14. So, there are, um, in AP chemistry, we're going to separate acids and bases into two basic categories. Strong acids and bases and weak acids and bases, okay? So, what is a strong acid? Now, everything I say for the strong acid will also apply to the strong base. A strong acid is an acid that is, you know, solid. All acids and bases are solid when, you, when they're not dissolved in solution. All acids and bases look like salt because that's what they are. They're salt. Ionic substances are called salts when they are not in solution, okay? So you take the acid salt, the solid acid, and then when you dissolve it in solution, a strong acid fully dissociates. And what I mean when I say fully dissociates, I mean a strong acid, once we put it in solution, there is zero AH, and, there it, and it all becomes A minus and H plus. Okay? So a strong acid, I'm going to give you some examples, and you need to memorize these examples. Okay? Strong acids are HCl, HBr, HI, uh, SO, uh, excuse me, H2SO4, HClO4, and one more, HNO3. Okay? You need to memorize those. You need to memorize what the strong acids are. Okay? Now, let's see if we can name them. Hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, sulfuric acid, perchloric acid, nitric acid. You see that the names bear a striking resemblance to the polyatomic ions that I remember that I instructed you to memorize, okay? Sulfuric acid, for example. Let's take that guy. That guy dissociates into 2H plus plus SO4 2 minus. That is the sulfate ion. Perchloric acid that dissociates into H plus plus the perchlorate ion. HNO3 nitric acid dissociates into H plus plus the nitrate ion. Okay? Hope we all see the connection. You need to memorize these. Next, let me list out for you the strong bases. The strong bases are a bit more simple to memorize. A strong base is just, if you look at your periodic table, you look at the two left columns, the alkali and the alkaline metals, the two leftmost columns, excluding hydrogen, and you see things like uh, potassium, lithium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, things like that. Any of the uh, metals from the left two columns bonded to an OH to an OH is a strong base. Okay? That's simple. Most common among them are KOH and NaOH. Now in the examples of calcium, calcium is a 2 plus ion. So it would be in the form of CaOH2. It would dissociate into Ca2 plus plus 2OH minus. Okay? So just to reiterate, a strong acid and a strong base, once you put it in solution, 
all of it dissociates. If I put two moles of sodium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, hydroxide ion, sodium ion, if I put two moles of that in solution, that's going to become two moles of Na plus and two moles of OH minus. Okay? Now that stands in comparison to weak acids and bases. Weak acids and bases do not fully dissociate in water. If I drop a weak acid or weak base salt, solid, into the solution, and when it dissolves, some of it is going to remain in the unified form, some of it is going to become dissociated, all right? So, let's welcome back the rice table, okay? Because if uh, you reasoned your way through this, if I took a strong acid like HCl, that would be a hard arrow into H plus and Cl minus. Now I write the equations like this, you should be writing them like this. H2O plus HCl becomes H3O plus plus Cl minus. Okay? Weak acids and bases, uh, let me give you an example, like NH3, ammonia. All right? For some context, if you memorize all of the strong acids and bases, and you come across something on the AP exam that is not a strong acid or a strong base, it's automatically a weak acid or base. If it's not a strong, it has to be a weak. Okay, there's no gray area. There's no, oh, I haven't seen this before. That means I don't know what it is. No, if I haven't seen it before, it means it's a weak base. Okay? These are the extent, the comprehensive list of all of the strong acids and bases you will see on the AP exam. So, NH3 exists in equilibrium with uh, H2O as one of the reactants. It exists in equilibrium as NH4 plus, it stole a proton from H2O, it stole a proton from H2O, and OH minus. The strong bases instantly dissociate into an OH minus. The weak bases steal a hydrogen from water, and if they steal a hydrogen from water, the water becomes OH minus, okay? So this is an equilibrium. And what do we do when we see an equilibrium? We do a rice table. Yes. Let's just pretend you're given a problem that says, okay, I am given a weak base. Well, they're not gonna tell you it's a weak base. They're gonna tell you I'm given NH3, okay? And NH3 has a KB, we're gonna get into what that is in just a moment, it has a KB of one times 10 to the negative five. So KB, if you might assume, K is our equilibrium constant. K represents concentration of products over reactants. So Kb would be the equilibrium constant for a base, a base equilibrium. So what are our uh, products here? NH4 plus OH minus. Those are both ions, therefore we know they're aqueous, so we know they participate in our equation. NH3 is also aqueous, because it is what we dissolved in the solution. It is the salt that we dissolved. It's our base, okay? H2O is the solvent. H2O, because it's the solvent, it is a liquid, it is in the state liquid, and it does not participate in the equation. Liquid does not participate. The, it, will, it participates in the equation, it does not participate in the K expression. If we do that, products over reactants, we get concentration of NH4 plus times concentration OH minus all over concentration NH3. So if they're giving me a KB value, that's obviously what I would substitute in. And now this looks just like the rice charts we did in the last unit. We write our reaction, NH3 plus H2O is in equilibrium with NH4 plus plus OH minus. H2O, liquid, big X. Okay, our initial concentration of NH3. The problem would go a little something like this. I have this many grams of NH3. 
how, what is the pH of the solution when I drop this many grams of NH3 into the solution. Let's say it's 20 grams of NH3, okay? If you've got 20 grams of NH3, you'd go to your reference table and you'd see, okay, the molar mass of hydrogen is 1.008. So I do three times 1.008 because we've got three hydrogens. Then I do a molar mass of nitrogen. Nitrogen is 14.01 plus 14.01. And I add that up and I get 17.034, that is the molar mass of my NH3. I do 20 grams divided by 17.034 to get my moles. I have 1.17 moles of NH3, okay? And then it would give me, the, the directions would give me the volume of the container. And let's just say for simplicity's sake that the volume of the container is one liter. So I take my 1.17 moles, I divide it by my one liter, and I get my concentration is 1.17 molar. That goes in my initial concentration of NH3. Okay? So, initially, the reaction hasn't happened yet. I have no NH4, I have no OH-, okay? So what is my change? I'm going to lose some amount of base, and I'm going to form some NH4 and some OH-, okay? Therefore, at the end, I'm going to have 1.17 minus B, 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 okay? So in equilibrium, this is going to be my concentration of NH3, concentration of NH4+, plus, concentration of hydroxide ion. I take my equilibrium expression, and I plug in those values. Concentration of NH4+, plus, B. Concentration of OH-, minus, B. Concentration of NH3, 1.17 minus B. That equals Kb, which is 1 times 10 to the negative fifth, and I just solve for B. So I'm going to rewrite this as B squared. And since our Kb, our K value, is less than 1 times 10 to the negative 3, I can write, assume B is small. If I assume B is small, I can neglect any B that is in addition or subtraction to a constant number. So we originally had 1.17 minus b. If we assume b is small, we can neglect any b that is being subtracted from that 1.17. So now that I've got this equation, I just simply solve for b. And I get b equals 0 0.0034. And if I want to write that in scientific notation, I can write 3.4 times 10 to the negative 3. So that is my b. All right. Now, if I look back at my chart, I see that B represents the concentration of OH-. So I have just solved for the concentration of OH-. That equals concentration OH-. Okay. Now that I have concentration of OH-, remember, the question was asking us for the pH of the solution. If I have this, I can go back here and I say my pOH equals the negative log of my OH minus, and if I have pOH, I can calculate pH because they both add to 14. So what I do here is since I have OH minus, I take the negative log of this value and I get my pOH equals 2.47. If you get a negative number, it means you forgot to add your negative sign right here. Okay, you should always get a positive number. Now that I have my pOH, do not make the stupid mistake of circling this as your final answer. Okay, the question asks you for pH, not pOH. So we bring back our equation. pOH plus pH equals 14. And I say, okay, I just need to do 14 minus 2.47 
and I get the pH of the solution, 2.47, and that gives me 11.53. That is your final answer. That is your pH. pH is a unitless metric. You do not write units for pH. Moving on from there, we have uh, what kids call the bane of their existence, okay? This is what is arguably the most common FRQ on the uh, AP exam. You should plan to have this exact type of FRQ on your AP exam, okay? It usually happens once, but it's usually the longest FRQ, okay? The FRQ is this. Uh, you're given something like, I've got two liters of water, and then from there, they're going to tell you that, okay, um, I added something like 20 grams of a weak acid. Let's continue with this, because we already lived I added 20 grams of NH3 to the solution, okay, and allowed that to reach equilibrium. And then I added uh, 14 grams, or let's call it four grams of HCl, strong acid, okay? They, they would write it just like this. You would have to instantly know NH3, weak base, HCl, strong acid, okay? And then they would tell you, okay, the Kb of NH3 is 1.10 times 1 times 10 to the negative fifth. That's a dead giveaway that NH3 is a weak base because only weak acids have a Ka and only weak bases have a Kb. So if they give you a Kb, light bulb should be going off in your head to say, okay, that's a weak base. If they give you a Ka, same thing, that's a weak acid. Anyway, so, what we do here, we convert both of our metrics to moles. Okay, we already converted this to moles. This was 1.17 moles. And um, I'm just gonna call this X moles, X moles of HCl, okay? If I've got X moles of HCl, since I know HCl, completely dissociates, I can say that once my X moles of HCl go into solution, I'm gonna have X moles of H3O plus, okay? So, now what I do is X moles of H3O plus is going to react quantitatively with NH3. What does the word quantitatively mean? means all of the H3O plus reacts, okay? So I'm going to set up that equation. I'm going to have H3O plus plus NH3 is going to give me NH4 plus plus H2O, okay? I'm going to set up that equation, and that's a hard arrow because every time H3O plus reacts with something, it reacts quantitatively. All right, so you're going to need to think up this reaction. You're going to need to draw this up, and it's pretty simple to draw, okay? I'm given a weak base, and I'm given a strong acid, okay? That strong acid is gonna become H3O plus. I'm given two reactants, okay? Those are the only two reactants I can have in my equation. I can't draw a reaction between, uh, like, OH minus and NH3 because I don't have OH minus. I'm given two reactants, so those are the only two reactants I'm allowed to put in my equation. And then you say, okay, I'm given my two reactants, now let me think this through. What kind of products will those produce? NH3 is a base. Bases steal protons. And H3O plus is a proton. It's going to steal the proton, become NH4, and it's going to give the uh, very unstable H3O+, and it's going to return it to H2O. So hard arrow. I have X moles H3O+, and I have 1.17 moles NH3. 
Now it's time to determine which one's my limiting reactant. Limiting reactant means which one do I have fewer moles of. Let's just say that, you know, let me calculate this. This is 0 0.1 moles of H3O plus. So I'm going to have 0 0.1 moles here. And I can see H3O plus is my limiting reactant. So only 0 0.1 moles of this reaction is going to go forward. All right. So that means once everything's said and done, reactants are going to be consumed to form products. I only have 0 0.1 mole of this, so this is going to become 0. This is going to become 1.07 moles, because 0 0.1 moles of this and this was used up. Therefore, I'm going to produce 0. Point, I'm going to, excuse me, that should go down here. I'm going to produce 0 0.1 moles NH4 plus and 0 0.1 moles H2O. Okay. Now, I've got a concentration of NH3, and I've got a concentration of NH4+. Not a concentration. I have molar amounts of each of these two reactants, okay? And now, there is no more strong acid in my solution. There's no more strong acid. I don't need to worry about it anymore. All of the strong acid has already reacted. The strong acid converted the NH3 to NH4+. So now with these values, now I'm free to do my weak base reaction. Now I'm free to do my equilibrium. Now I'm free to set up my rice. Okay? So, in my rice table, there's only one way a base can enter into equilibrium. You can have the original base plus water being in equilibrium with the conjugate acid plus OH minus. Okay? I used a new word there. I said conjugate acid. In the Bronsted definition of acids and bases, every time an acid goes through a reaction, there you start with a conjugate base, and on the other side of the reaction, you have a conjugate acid. Okay? They're conjugates of each other. They're like a pair. Okay? A base, like we said, accepts or steals a proton. Okay? An acid donates a proton. NH4 plus is an acid. NH4 plus can donate a proton. And if it donates a proton, it's going to turn right back into NH3. We have a conjugate acid-base pair. I covered this when we covered acid-base reactions, back when we covered a chemical reactions unit, okay? But every reaction that involves a base will form a conjugate acid, and every uh, reaction that forms an acid will form a conjugate base, okay? Take HCl, for example. HCl reacts with water to form H3O+. Plus. H3O plus is the conjugate acid to H2O. That means H2O and H3O plus are a conjugate acid base pair. Okay? H2O plus can accept a proton. I mean, excuse me. H2O can accept a proton. H3O plus can donate a proton. Okay? And we also have our Cl minus. Cl- can accept a proton to become this, and HCl can donate a proton to become that. Conjugate acid-base pair. Anyway, back on topic. We were solving this equation. We had our equilibrium reaction with our weak base. Same thing that happens up here. Equilibrium reactions only happen in one way. Okay, H2O, liquid, cross it out. And now we put in the initial concentrations of NH3, like we did before. Except now, we also have an initial concentration of NH4. We didn't have that before, but now we do, you see. Now we have an initial concentration. So, after we uh, convert these to concentration, after we divide moles by liters, okay, this is going to become 0 0.5 
I'm going to round to four. Uh, excuse me, five, zero, four. And this is going to become 0 0.02. And our initial concentration of OH minus is zero. And now you would perform the rice table as you normally would. And you would say, okay, we're going to have minus some base here. We're going to plus some base, plus some base. And at equilibrium, we're going to be at 0 0.504 minus B. We're going to be at 0 0.02 plus B. And our concentration of OH minus is going to be B. Okay. So we're going to set up our equilibrium expression. We're going to take our KB, 1.10 times 1 times 10 to the negative fifth. And we're going to set that up equals concentration of products over reactants B times 0 0.02 plus B over reactants, which is 0 0.504 minus B. Okay. And as we can see here, our KB small, we're going to assume B is small. So now this guy is rewritten like this. It's going to be rewritten as B times 0 0.02 over 0 0.504. And then we're going to solve for B. Okay, same principle as before. B represents our concentration of OH minus. The FRQ asked us for the pH of the solution. And we go through the same steps. We convert concentration of OH minus to POH, and we go from POH to pH. Okay, that is largely what will be assessed in FRQ form. Okay, there's still a bunch of remainder topics that they like to assess in form of multiple choice. There's going to be like 12 multiple choice questions on your AP exam based off of what I'm about to cover between now and the end of the video. Okay, so next we're going to cover the buffer solution. The buffer solution is a solution that resists a change in pH. So if I took a buffer solution and I added HCl to it, hydrochloric acid, strong acid, and I said, let me measure the pH now, the pH would very slightly change, if at all. If I added NaOH, strong base, to a buffer solution, and I measured the pH afterwards, the pH would barely change, okay? That's what a buffer solution is. So how do we make a buffer solution? A buffer solution is when we take a weak acid base reaction, you know, we get NH3 reacting with H2O to be in equilibrium with NH4 plus plus OH minus. The KB equals 1 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay? I wrote PKB now, but we understand what that means now. P just means negative log of the KB. So the negative log of the KB would just be 5 in this case. Okay? So in this arrangement, you can see that we have a conjugate base right here conjugate base, and here we've got a conjugate acid. If I were to add an acid to this solution, like I said before, if I were to add hydrochloric acid, strong acid, the hydrochloric acid would react with the base, the conjugate base, okay? And that reaction is a reaction I just showed you over on that whiteboard. It would be NH3 takes the proton from HCl and becomes NH4. Okay, so now the concentration of H plus never changed because NH3 consumed all of the H plus to make NH4. That's how it resists changes in pH. Same applies if I were to add sodium hydroxide, NaOH. If I were to add NaOH, that would react with the conjugate acid. And that would react like this, NH4 plus plus OH minus the OH minus steals the proton from NH4 plus, and that becomes NH3 plus H2O, okay? So as you see here, even though I added OH minus to the solution, 
the concentration of OH- never changed because all of the OH- was consumed to convert the conjugate acid to the conjugate base. Okay? So, but there is a point where I keep adding more and more NaOH and eventually I use up all of the NH4+. When I use up all of the NH4+, then I say the buffer solution is at capacity. It cannot handle any more NaOH. So if I add NaOH after I've reached buffer capacity, then the pH starts to change radically. Okay? So, how do we make a buffer solution? Well, as you can see here, it all centers around a weak base or a weak acid. I take, like, NH3, okay, and I put NH3 in solution, weak base, like we've been saying, and with NH3, I give it a little bit of HCl. Okay, let's say I have four moles of NH3, I'm going to react it with two moles of HCl. Okay, and if I do that, I'm going to produce two moles of NH4+. All right, so at the end of everything, I originally started with zero moles of this. I'm going to consume two moles, so now I have two moles NH3. I've got zero moles of the strong acid, and now I have two moles NH4+. So what I just did there is now I have equimolar, equimolar means same molarity, equimolar concentrations of conjugate base and conjugate acid. Okay? That's what I did when I added the HCl. I created a buffer solution. Because now that I have a good amount of NH4+, when I add OH- to the solution, the NH4+, is going to consume the OH- and shift back to NH3. If I add more acids to the solution, the NH3 is going to consume that acid and shift back to NH4+. Now, a useful equation before we move forward, uh, Ka times Kb equals Kw. And if you remember, Kw equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So, I can convert between Ka and Kb using this equation. Okay, Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. pH, let me try and not obstruct this, equals pKa. Okay, pKa. We have a Kb. Okay, in order to get pKa from a Kb, I need to use this equation, convert uh, Kb to Ka because this, the right side of the equation, is just a constant number, so I can convert between those. And once I get Ka, I take negative log of Ka. That's how I get pKa. Continuing with the equation, plus the log of concentration of A minus over concentration of HA. Okay? This equation is not on your reference table. You will need to memorize this. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that when the pH is less than the pKa, the solution is primarily uh, dominated by the uh, conjugate acid. It's primarily dominated by the conjugate acid. Okay? So in this case, HA would represent the uh, component that has the extra proton, NH4+, and A- would represent the uh, species that has that is proton deficient. That would be our NH3. Okay? pH, if the pH is less than the pKa, that means our conjugate acid is dominating the equilibrium. Okay? And we can see that here. If our pH is 1 and our pKa is 2, that means that this term must be negative, okay? If this term is negative, if you can picture the graph of the uh, logarithm, the logarithm has a graph that looks like this, okay? In order for the logarithm to have a negative value, 
it must be really small, okay? So what do I do to make this section really small? I make the denominator huge, okay? If my denominator's huge, that means I have a lot of the protonated form of the conjugate base. So in this form, that means that if this term is negative, that means that my conjugate acid is dominating. Because if my conjugate acid is dominating, I have a large base. If I have a large base, I have a negative value. Moving forward from there, we have the all too infamous titration. Okay, specifically we're talking about titration curves. All right, it's a simple graph. You're gonna see a graph, uh, let me make the thing a bit taller. You're gonna see a graph of a pH on the y-axis and volume of titrant on the x-axis. Before we go forward with this, I really hope all of you are really masters on what I taught you what a titration is. If you're a bit hazy or if you don't remember a lot about what I taught you about titrations, uh, go back to um, whatever unit that is. It's going to be our unit on chemical reactions. Go to the section of the video where I talk about acid-base reactions. Okay, so like I said, the titrant is the thing that's in your burette. That's the thing that you know the concentration of, and you're adding volumes of it to your analyte. Okay? So, um, let's just say, for example, that an acid is your titrant, and a base is your analyte. Okay? And the pH is going to be the pH of the analyte. So a titration curve has a very distinct look to it. Since our base is an analyte, since the analyte is our base, we're going to, the pH of the base is going to be very high. And so we're going to start up here. And as we add volume of titrant, as we add acid, the pH is start, going to start to decrease, decrease. And then as it starts to, it starts to decrease extremely rapidly. And then it starts to even out again as we get closer to low. In a base, we have... OH minus floating in the solution, and in an acid we have excess H plus, or H3O plus floating in solution. So, if you're looking at the graph, the point in the graph of greatest slope, greatest slope means the steepest part of the graph, it's usually in the middle of the uh, big slope, steepest part of the graph, that's going to be what's called your equivalence point, is going to be when you have equimolar amounts of your base and your acid, of your analyte and your titrant, equimolar amounts. That means if I had 10 moles of base, that means at this volume, I added 10 moles of acid. So therefore, the equivalence point is when, if I was reacting HCl as my acid in my uh, burette, and with I was reacting that with NH3 as the base in my flask at the bottom of the burette. That means that if I had originally had 10 moles of NH3, the equivalence point would be when I added 10 moles of HCl. And the equivalence point gives you an equivalence pH. If you are reacting a strong acid with a strong base, the equivalence pH will always be 7. If you are reacting weak base with strong acid or weak acid with strong base, then the equivalence pH will differ from 7. So in this case, I'm reacting strong acid with weak base. My pH is going to differ from, my equivalence pH is going to differ from 7. So very common way that uh, this type of FRQ would be asked is I do not know the concentration of my base. I do not know the uh, concentration of OH- minus in my base, okay? But I know the concentration of my acid. Let's say the concentration of my acid, my HCl, is one molar. From the concentration and from the volume at which we reach equivalence, I can calculate the moles of HCl that I added. And since I know that at equivalence, I have equimolar amounts of both, 
the amount of the moles of HCl that I added are equivalent to the moles of base in my flask, okay? And if I know the moles of base in my flask, I can determine what the original concentration of OH- was. But moving on from there, we have something called the one-half equivalence point. Now, it doesn't happen at like an easily identifiable place on the graph. You know, it, it happens at, let's say this was a volume of 40 ml. The half equivalence point would happen at a volume of 20 ml. So you just have to eye it and see where on the graph that would take you, okay? Half equivalence means half of the volume necessary to take us to equivalence has been added, okay? At half equivalence, half equivalence is a very important uh, location because at half equivalence, the concentration, conjugate acid, equals the concentration of your conjugate base, okay? So in this case, this was a titration of HCl, of NH3 with HCl. So at the half equivalence point, the protonated form the concentration of NH4 plus equals the concentration of NH3. This is just two characteristics that you need to memorize. At the one-half equivalence point, the concentration of conjugate acid equals the concentration of your conjugate base. And the pH of the solution at one-half equivalence equals the pKa of your uh, weak base or weak acid. If you're given a weak base, you can invert that to say the pOH of the solution equals the pKb of your conjugate base. If you looked at this and you say, hey, wait a minute, I don't have a pKa, I just have a Kb. I would need to convert Kb to Ka and then convert Ka to pKa and then that would equal pH. Or if I was given a weak base, like I was given here, I would start with Kb. I say, okay, I just convert Kb to pKb, simple enough. That equals my pOH, and it's much easier to convert from pOH to pH, because like I said before, pOH plus pH equals 14. Okay, so these are two important characteristics of what happens at one-half equivalence. You just got to memorize that. Moving on from there, we have our last topic, I would say, in the acid-bases unit, and that's a topic all about the structure of acids and bases, okay? Structure of acids and bases. Very, very rare on an AP exam, okay? When I took my AP exam, there was not a single question on this topic. One of my friends had a different version of the exam, and I asked him, did you see any of this? He had one question, okay? So if you're pressed for time, if you were to skip anything and save time, save time here. Just go to the next video. If, you know, you want to be prepared for the worst, tag along. Okay, so this topic pretty much deals with why are strong acids strong and why are weak bases weak, okay? Let's take hydrochloric acid, for example, all right? Hydrochloric acid dissociates to H plus Cl minus, okay? The reason it's a strong acid is because Cl- is very stable, okay? Cl- is more stable than Cl bonded to a hydrogen, okay? Chlorine, it has seven valence electrons, and because it has seven valence electrons, it really wants that uh, eighth valence electron, okay? it does not like to share with hydrogen. So, the stability of Cl-, the conjugate base, the stability of the conjugate base determines how acidic this is, okay? Let me say that in a different way. The more stable the conjugate base is, the more it wants to be by itself. Okay, the more stable the conjugate base is, the more it's like, okay, I don't need the hydrogen. The more stable it is by itself, the more it's going to want to get rid of the hydrogen. That's why HCl is a strong base. Okay, same goes for hydrobromic. 
and hydroiodic acid. It got its eight valence electrons, now it's super happy. It doesn't need hydrogen anymore. It can get rid of hydrogen. That's why 100% of HCl gets rid of its hydrogen. Now, that stands in contrast with hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. That's because fluorine is a very small atom. Like we said before, ionic radius decreases to a maximum at helium. But since helium doesn't react, we stop at fluorine. Fluorine is a very small atom, so it holds hydrogen very close. It's very difficult to separate hydrogen and fluorine because they're such small atoms. F minus is comparatively less stable than Cl minus. F minus is less stable than I minus. F minus wants its hydrogen. So the real comparison is, does, will the base be more stable with the hydrogen? Okay, and if the base is more stable with the hydrogen, then it's a weak acid. If the base is more stable without the hydrogen, then it's a strong acid, okay? So we can exhibit that uh, with respect to sulfuric acid, H2SO4 minus, H2SO4. That dissociates into 2H plus plus an SO4 2 minus, okay? Now this is a polyatomic. It's a bit more complex than the monoatomic ions we see here. Okay? So, in order to look at the stability of this guy, we're going to have to draw its Lewis structure. Sulfur, double bond O, double bond O, single bond O, single bond O. Okay? And these two O's bear the minus charge. This is in 2 minus. So, uh, fun fact. Since these two oxygens bear the minus charge, this is where the H plus unites at these two oxygens. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid because the sulfate ion is very stable without the hydrogens, okay? What makes it so stable? Oxygen is a very electronegative atom. Since oxygen is a very electronegative atom, it really likes to have a minus charge. It's fine with that. It doesn't make a big fuss about it. So oxygen can say, okay, I like this minus charge. I don't need hydrogen anymore. Hydrogen can go away. The same principle uh, is with perchloric acid. Perchloric acid is HClO4 2 minus, no, just one minus. HClO4 dissociates into H plus and ClO4 minus. ClO4 minus ion is chlorine, double bond O, double bond O, double bond O, single bond O, minus. Okay, so it's at this point right here where it unites with the H plus, right? The O, oxygen, very electronegative atom. Okay, oxygen is just fine bearing its minus charge and saying, I don't need the hydrogen anymore. The extra oxygens that you see around here serve to stabilize the ion this way. Since the oxygens are very electronegative, this oxygen takes this minus charge and the oxygen pulls the minus charge closer to it, okay? Electronegative atoms do that. They take minus charge and they push and they pull the minus charge closer to them. So, when the perchlorate ion dissociates from its H+, the minus charge isn't at a single oxygen, it's more like a partial negative charge at all the oxygens, okay? And the same goes for the uh, sulfate ion, it's more like a partial minus charge at all of the oxygens, okay? So, since the minus charge is evenly distributed, and everyone's happy, that stabilizes this ion very much, okay? That also means that the fewer oxygens you have, the less stable you are. So, it's a perfect example of that, is the chlorate ion. It's ClO3. ClO3, when compared to ClO4, ClO4 is a strong acid, ClO3 is a weak acid. ClO2 
is, a, a, is an even weaker acid, and ClO is a much weaker acid, okay? And this is perchlorate, chlorate, chlorite, and hypochlorite. You should know those because you memorized your ions, right? Like these are all one minus charges. Okay. So that's acids and bases, unit eight. Thanks so much. Enjoy your life, guys.